I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, because I don't like that when somebody says, everybody raise your hand, you know, I, maybe I'm not a joiner, I don't know, but anyways, uh, I, I have a, a, a question to ask to, before I start. <clears throat> How many people here want to go to heaven? I mean, you know. Okay, let, let's put it the other way. The people who don't want to go to heaven, you raise your hand. <laughs> right. Well, of course, in the passage I just read, uh, Jesus explains what it takes to go to heaven for all of those who want to go there. And I assume if you're here this morning, it's because you want to go, you want to, go to heaven. Listen carefully to what Jesus says you need to do if this is what you want. Number one, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that's number one. You want to go to heaven, you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And number two, they're not, there's no number three. There's just number one and number two. Number two, remain faithful until the end. Mark 13, 13, Jesus says, you'll be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. There you go, number one, number two, that's it. All other teachings by Jesus, and the apostles about this subject can be folded into these two ideas. For example, the commands to repent and be baptized, to love our brothers, to bear fruit, to worship in spirit and truth and so on. All of these are various ways to express our faith in Jesus Christ. And those teachings that talk about you know, personal holiness and prayer life and perseverance and the importance of developing relationships with God and others, all of these things speak to the ongoing process of remaining faithful to the Lord for a lifetime. Now of these two, you know, faith in Christ and remaining faithful until death, I believe the second one, remaining faithful, this is the more difficult one. After all, the line between disbelief and belief is usually crossed just one time. Oh, it may require time and patience, but once a person believes and is baptized, they rarely go back to just all out disbelief. Faithfulness, on the other hand, is mostly about delayed gratification. The reward comes at the end. You see, you need to finish your life faithfully in order to receive what the Bible calls the crown of, the crown of life. James chapter one, verse 12. Another reason why I think faithfulness is difficult is that it has so many enemies lying in wait to destroy it. Jesus mentions a few of these enemies in the parable of the seed planting in Matthew 13. For example, a persecution for believing God's word, that's one of the enemies of remaining faithful. He says in Matthew 13, uh, let's see, verse uh, 20, 21, he says, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. In other words, the pressure from non-believers to stop being faithful or stop holding to our principles or, or to lower or compromise our Christian values, this is a constant attack. And some people, they don't last long. First attack, they're done. And then Jesus says another enemy of faithfulness, 
are the cares of this world in verse 22 and he says, and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, all those things that are not necessarily evil, but they get in the way of us being faithful to Christ and His church. Sickness, bad weather, conflict with people, stress, failure, work, moving, stuff. <laughs> it all just gets in the way. And before you know it, you're drowning in the business of family and life and you have no time for the Lord. And then Jesus also mentions the allure of wealth, you know, in verse 22, the deceitfulness of riches. That's another enemy of faithful living. The desire to be rich, not being rich, the desire to be rich, to be first, to succeed, to be valued, to find our place in the world, not find our place in the kingdom, to find our place in the world. Someone once said, if you think you've found your place in the world, that means you've, you've lost your place in the kingdom. The deceit is that this desire and the effort that goes into it takes our focus away from Christ and His will for us. The desire for wealth and success dulls our spirit and, and, and interferes with our commitment to finishing. Why? because we put aside spiritual things just for a while in order to pursue wealth and either we lose our way or we never come back to Christ because pursuing wealth becomes the priority. When the main question that you ask yourself before making any decision is, how much will this cost me? You are far away from the kingdom and you are well into the world. Now, in addition to these enemies that Jesus points out in his parable, there are numerous other obstacles that make remaining faithful to the end difficult. Let me just name just a few more. One of them is our personal sins. You know, aside from persecution and the cares and pleasures of the world, there is the matter of our own sinfulness that discourages us from finishing. Remember, it's from finishing. Seeing our own weaknesses and failings uh, to do or to be what we want to be in Christ, many times this kills our desire to continue on in the faith. You know, when you say to yourself, I'm just not good enough for this, you know, I'm just not. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm just not a good man. You know, I've just reviewed some of the things that go through my brain. Some of the thoughts that I have in my heart, some of the desires that I have, and I, and I realize I'm just not a good person. How, how can I ever make it to the end? Yeah, that stuff, that gets in the way of finishing. And then of course, unbelievers who draw us away. How many people have ignored Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16, not to be yoked or partnered with unbelievers and learn to live and regret it? Unbelievers influencing and discouraging believers to let go their faith in order to maintain a friendship or some kind of business or family relationship. Those who are not committed to Christ will never be a help to us in remaining faithful. I'm not saying we shouldn't have relationships with non-Christians, I mean, that would be impossible. I'm just reminding you that those who refuse to believe and honor Christ will always be a challenge to our own faithfulness, so we have to be aware of this. The one who has openly rejected Christ and not interested in heaven is not interested in you going to heaven either. I mean, I could go on with the list of reasons why remaining faithful until the end, in my opinion, is the most difficult command of the Lord to follow. You know, the commentators talking about World Series, 
You know, in baseball, for example, they're always listing you know, what it takes for a team to reach the finals and win you know, the championship. You know, if it's baseball, they say, well, it takes a team that, that stays healthy. You got to stay healthy. If you're not healthy, you can't make it to the end. Or it takes a solid, uh, uh, solid pitching. You got to have a, a good bullpen. Or you need to have hitters that can hit in the clutch or whatever. You know, things that it takes to make it to the end. Well, in the same way, I'd like to share with you what I think it takes for Christians to remain faithful to the end and get to heaven. Like the sign out front says, what does it take to get to heaven? Well, number one, it takes a firm decision. A firm decision. The first step in any successful enterprise is always the decision to go ahead and not quit until the end. We need to make up our minds about Christ once and for all. We're in or we're out. Even if we don't know what the future holds. You know, Peter the Apostle is a good example of this. In John chapter 6, we see a situation where things were going badly as many disciples were deserting Jesus because it seemed that following Him was getting to be just a little too difficult. Jesus turns to His apostles and says, are you also going to leave me? You guys going to quit? And in verse 68, Peter replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus said to His closest disciples, make up your mind, decide, are you in or are you out once and for all? And Peter confirms his original decision to follow Jesus and give him the reasons why. He's not in, he's all the way in. You see, you can't be faithful until the end if you're continually questioning or renegotiating your decision to follow Jesus. Think of the ideal spouse. Most here are married or have been married. Think of the ideal spouse, those of you who are not married or unmarried and would like to be. What would you want in the ideal spouse? How about someone who is totally faithful without a single doubt? How about that? Would you like that in a spouse? How about somebody who is completely devoted to you and the family that the two of you will create? Would you like that in a spouse? How about a person who is there for you through good or bad times, no matter what? Would you like that in a spouse? Well, here's my point. You see, Jesus likes that in disciples too. The same thing that we want in a spouse, he'd like in a disciple. Hey, it wouldn't hurt if you decide that this is the kind of spouse and disciple that you will be. So being faithful to the end requires a firm decision once and for all that Jesus Christ is my Lord and I will be faithful to Him no matter what. Amen, church. Thank you, I need the encouragement. The second thing getting to heaven requires is a reality check. A reality check. Okay, so you, you've made the firm decision and you've said your amen. You see, just because you made the decision doesn't automatically get you to the end faithfully. You need to realize that once you've made the decision, the gloves come off as far as the battle for your soul is concerned. Once you say, I'm done, I'm going to follow Jesus, I never have before and I am going to now, or I've been you know, weak kneed about it and I'm just going to stiffen up and I'm going to really follow and I'm, going, I'm in, I'm all in Lord. The minute you make that decision, the gloves come off. Because once you decide that you will be faithful, everything to lead you away from that decision will come into your lives. Here are some fairly common things that I've seen in the last 39 years of ministry 
things that I've seen happen after someone decided to follow Jesus. Well, first of all, your old life shows up for a visit. <laughs> Whether it be your old sins or your old habits or your old activities or your old friends, these will reappear to draw you away from Christ. I'll give you an example in my own life. So I'm a very young man, I'm, I'm not a Christian yet, but I'm searching. And I decide in my searching, you know what? I've got to stop living the way I live. I, you know, I'm, I'm taking dope and I'm just, you know, I'm useless. I, I've got to do something with my life. So I just pick up my bags and I sell my car and I take the money and I buy a ticket. I'm living in Canada, in Montreal. And I buy a one-way ticket to Vancouver. And I said, you know, I'm going to go to the West Coast, you know, and just start anew. And I got to, you know, because I got to get away from this old life. So I get on the train and I, and I, and I go to Vancouver you know, and, I, and I'm living at the YMCA and I'm trying to start things new and I get a package in the mail from my cousin who's living in Montreal. And in the package was a quarter pound of pure hash. <laughs> that this idiot sent through Canada Post. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't put a return address. <laughs> so here I am sitting in a YMCA you know, room in Vancouver with very little money, having decided to swear off, you know, no more booze, no more drugs, you know, I'm going to see what life is about, I'm going to search for something better. You know. And there sitting on my bed is a quarter pound of pure hash. I had to make a decision. You know why? Because my old life showed up. It followed me west. Yeah, you want to know what I did, don't you? <laughs> I mailed it to another friend of mine who I knew was still <laughs> taking drugs in Montreal. I wasn't completely out of the woods, but yeah, your old life shows up. Or someone or something will come between you and the church. You know, the church is Christ's body and one of its functions is to help each member remain faithful to the Lord. And the best way to draw someone away from Christ, therefore, is to find a way to separate him or her from the church. People who are separated from the body, for whatever reason, are usually separated from the head of the body, which is Jesus, and they're separated without much effort and little time. Don't ever buy into the idea, well, I'm, I'm a good Christian. Do you go to church? Oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't need to do that. Need the Lord, we got a thing. No, you don't have a thing. You don't have a thing unless you have a thing with the body. Another thing that challenges our commitment to fidelity, and that is doubt because of personal failure. Those who have decided to follow Christ take failure very, very hard. I think I do more spiritual counseling and encouragement to good Christian men and women who just are beat up by their own conscience than down and, you know, down and dirty sinners who are thinking of repenting. Those who have decided to follow Christ, they take failure very hard, you know, moral failure or sickness or financial trouble or conflict at home or with other Christians. It hurts them terribly. Many believers mistakenly equate failure with loss of faith or doubt. For example, they say to themselves, if I really believed, then I wouldn't fail or I wouldn't fail so badly or I wouldn't fail so often, or I wouldn't fail in this way. The mistaken idea is that if God is good and my faith is true and the church is right, then all these things, they wouldn't really happen to me, would they? Why should I continue? What's the point? You know, I, I've preached these type of sermons before, you know, telling people in advance what to watch out for, and they say, Amen, Brother Mike, and thank you, Brother Mike, for helping me stand firm. But many of them fall away anyways. 
This is a picture of the original congregation in Montreal that met in our home. This is about 1985, somewhere around there, 1985. 50% of these people here are no longer following Christ, at least. I'll tell you something, I'm no prophet, but there are some here today who will not be here in one year, let alone at the end of their lives. All because they couldn't face reality. Being faithful means facing opposition from every direction. That's why Jesus said, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Matthew 10, 36. Jesus didn't mean that you had to be at war with your family in order to be a Christian. He was simply warning those who had decided to follow him that in the battle for your faithfulness, even your own family could become an obstacle. That's how rough it can get. My mother said to me <laughs> when I told her that I had become a Christian and I was joyful about it, and she should have been happy that I was a Christian, you know, I'd at least stop doing the crazy things that I was doing. She said, I give you two years. <laughs> I give it two years. Another one of your crazy ideas, you know. So if you want to be faithful to the end, it requires that you be aware of how nasty the fight is going to be and the price that you may have to pay in order to get to the end. And then finally, aside from a firm decision and a serious reality check, in order to be faithful until the end, it takes trust in the Lord. Jesus has not asked us to do what is impossible. The Hebrew writer says that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12. In other words, he's there at the beginning, helping us to believe unto salvation. He's there washing us clean of sin and baptism and blessing us with the Holy Spirit at the beginning of our walk. And he's also there guiding and sustaining us each day in our walk of faith until the end. As he's promised, I am with you always, Matthew 28, 20. And in Hebrews 13, 5, the Spirit says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. It's not that he's just at the finish line waiting for us to arrive. He's with us every step of the way through every obstacle and discouragement and temptation. He's always there. So when I win, I trust that he will receive my praise and thanksgiving. And when I lose, I trust in his continued grace and mercy and I move on. And when I'm tempted or doubtful or discouraged or confused, I trust that he can and he will enable me to continue believing in him and show me the way that I must go. I trust him enough to look forward to the promise of heaven and not backwards to my many, many, many failures. The number one mistake all of us make, we look backwards instead of forwards. What does Paul say? Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And what is the prize of the upward call? It's eternal life with God in heaven. That's the prize. I trust him enough to know that what he has promised, he will indeed give me in the end. So I run the race with confidence. You can't be faithful to the end without trusting in Jesus, because that's what the journey is about. It's about trust, every step of the way. We enter into eternal heavenly realms by the power of the Son of God, and we are carried there by the wings of trust which we develop through a lifetime of faithfulness to Him. You know, there's an old saying that goes, <clears throat> Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That saying may be true for doubters and unbelievers because they don't know what to expect after death, so they don't want to die. They want to have heaven here on earth. 
They'd like to go to heavenly place, but they're not sure it exists, so they'd rather stay here on earth as long as they can, just in case. For Christians, this saying should be changed to the following. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but only a few make the decision once and for all to go there. And only a few are ready for the opposition that they will encounter along the way. And only a few are willing to completely trust Jesus to get them there safely. When Jesus said, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it, Matthew 7, 14, he wasn't saying that God wanted the way to be narrow and difficult with only a few on it. That's not what he wants. He just knew that not everybody, certainly not the majority, would be willing to give what it would take to find the road and then follow it all the way home. I know that everyone here wants to go to heaven. I just hope that after this lesson, you'll also know what it will take to get you there. If anyone here this morning needs help to begin the journey through repentance and baptism or the prayers to carry on in a difficult moment, please, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs> 